The next item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 11078 in the name of David Stewart on petition PE1458, Register of Interest for Members of Scotland's Judiciary. Could I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on David Stewart to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee. Mr Stewart, ten minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. A few short years ago, uh, this Parliament sent me to Johannesburg in South Africa to address a major conference on the role of public petitions. After I addressed the conference, a young American professor took the stage. He told the story of President Kennedy visiting the space agency NASA. During the tour, he talked to an elderly cleaner who was washing the canteen floor. The cleaner told the president they had worked for NASA since its inception in 1958 and that his job was to put a man on the moon. Well, the Petitions Committee does not aspire to put a man on the moon, but to be a window of the Parliament, to be accessible, to go the extra mile for each and every petitioner. Of course, President Officer, there is no magic wand, but we acknowledge where we have had successful petitions on cancer drugs, on pain relief and on mesh devices. And I welcome the opportunity given to the Committee to highlight to Parliament today the issues raised by Peter Cherby in his petition seeking a Registrar of Interest for Scotland's judiciary. And I'd like to put on record my thanks to all committee members and to all who have provided evidence. <laughs> Mr Cherby petitioned the Parliament seeking the creation of a Registrar of Procuring Interests of Judges' Bill. His petition was brought to the Parliament at the end of 2012, and since then the committee has been listening to the arguments in favour and against. At the onset, I should say, that part of Mr Cherby's motivation in bringing this issue to the Scottish Parliament was the consideration in New Zealand of a Members' Bill by Dr Kennedy Graham of the New Zealand Green Party. I understand that the Members' Bill there had its origins in the resignation of a former New Zealand Supreme Court judge who was accused of misconduct for allegedly failing to disclose a large debt he apparently owed to a lawyer appearing in a case before him. The Committee's motivation in giving consideration to this issue and seeking time in this chamber to debate is on a point of principle and from a starting point of an assumption of openness and transparency in all areas of public life, if you like, to shine a light in every corner of Scottish society. The petitioner said that the catalyst for his petition was investigations by the Scottish media into members in the judiciary here. The petitioner told the committee that the media investigations had revealed a number of criminal charges and convictions. The petitioner points out that there is a greater public expectation now in terms of transparency and accountability across all branches of public life, and that the judiciary has a duty to be accountable, accountable to the wider community, and it should be expected to adhere to the same standards as those which apply to others in public life, such as MSPs, ministers and, of course, MPs. Now, this Parliament prides itself on being open and accessible. That was one of the cornerstones of this institution developed by our founding fathers from the work of the Constitutional Convention. We on the Public Petitions Committee seek to champion that approach across all areas of public life in Scotland. I personally, presiding officer, support an independent judiciary. I believe that is a crucial element in the separation of powers between the judiciary and the legislature. And this committee's motivation in considering the petition was not in any way about interfering with judicial independence, but rather it is about reflecting on whether reasonable modern-day public expectations with regard to transparency are being met. For example, presiding officer, prior to the creation of the Supreme Court in 2009, the highest court was the Appellate Committee of the House of Lords. The Law Lords were bound by the House of Lords disclosure rules, where financial interests were declared, so there is a precedent. For the most part, Scotland and its institutions have a good track record of openness and accessibility. In exercising its scrutiny function, this Parliament has worked to bring about improvements in these areas. But having a good track record, however, is not sufficient reason to say that we should not ever stop and think about what has been done and how it can be approved upon. We contacted Dr Graham in New Zealand about his bill. He told us that the judiciary there were not overtly enamoured at the suggestion of a registrar of interests. I think a fair assessment of the position here to say that is probably true of Scotland as well, as far as the judiciary are concerned. Dr Graham also told us that the Chief Justice and the President of the Court of Appeal testified before the Select Committee on the Bill. 
As members will be well aware, the Public Petitions Committee invited Lord Gill, the head of Scotland's judiciary, to come and give evidence to the committee. Lord Gill declined to attend the meeting of the committee. That, of course, is his prerogative. But the committee is on record as expressing disappointment and not being able to hear from Lord Gill in person at one of its formal meetings. However, I and Deputy Convener Chick Brodie did meet Lord Gill informally here at the Parliament to discuss the petition, and that was useful. When the committee first sought views of what the petition seeks, we were told by the judiciary and the Scottish Government that the existing safeguards in place were sufficient. The existing safeguards are as follows. First of all, the judicial oath, which must be taken by all judicial office holders, requiring them, and I quote, to do right to all manner of people without fear or favour, affection or ill will. Secondly, the Statement of Principles of Judicial Ethics, for the Scottish Judiciary was published in 2010 and updated in 2013, which provides guidance for judges and draws attention to particular areas of potential sensitivity. The third safeguard we were directed to is the Judiciary and Courts Scotland Act of 2008. The Act contains provisions to regulate and investigate the conduct of judicial office holders and rules for dealing with complaints about these self-said judicial office holders. Now, the petitioners argued that there's no statistical or analytical information available or made available in terms of recordings about whether and how frequently declarations of interest are made. And I'll touch on that later in my speech, Mr. Officer. I'd like now to turn to some of the evidence received from Mo Ali, who at the time was the Judicial Complaints Reviewer, a role created by the Scottish Government to review the handling of complaint investigations by the Judicial Office of Scotland into members of the judiciary to ensure that complaints have been dealt with fairly. I know that Ms Ali has moved on and I wish her well in her current and future roles and I would like to put it on record that the evidence she provided to the committee, both written and in person, was well thought through and thought provoking. Now, Ms Ali made it clear in her role as the Judicial Complaints Reviewer she supported what the petition called for. Her view was that a register of interest would increase the transparency of the judiciary and contribute to public confidence in their actions and decisions. And I quote again, transparency tends to increase trust. Lack of transparency is more likely to create suspicion. Now that's quite a simple statement, but one in many ways goes to the heart of the issues that we come up during our consideration of this petition. In her view, the judiciary should not be out of line with what is required of others who hold high public office. She told us that she dealt with a complaint concerning a judge who had allegedly used the judicial position to promote a body that was alleged to have breached international law. And in another case, she dealt with a complaint about a sheriff who allegedly participated in a social function organised by a lawyer who had appeared before him at an earlier proof hearing. We did not receive any information about complaints received or considered from the judiciary. Now, Presiding officer, a judicial office holder will recruit or decline to hear the case in situations where it's felt there's a potential conflict of interest. Up until recently, there's been no published information about when and in what circumstances recusals were taking place. But I'm pleased to report that after the committee's interest, I raised the issue of the recording of recusals directly with the Lord President. Lord Grill has agreed now to ensure that information on recusals would be publicly available. So from April this year, all incidences of recusals and the reasons for them have been published in the judicial website. 14 such incidents have been notified and the move to make more information available is very welcome. For example, in April 2014 at Forfar Sheriff Court, Sheriff Veal personally knew a witness and quite correctly recused himself. However, I am aware that some feel this does not go far enough. The published information relates to those incidents is where the judicial office holder has been recused. What about incidences, no matter how rare, of a judicial office holder not willing to recuse despite having received representation? I'm not that clear where someone could get this information. Is it recorded? Is it available publicly? If not, uh, there's a, is there a reason for it not being available? And I understand from the judicial complaints reviewer that the complaints she saw were more about a failure to recuse, not about the lack of information on the recusals that did take place. Another question that arises is what recourse does someone have when an allegation of a conflict of interest comes to light after a court case has been heard? Is there no means by which someone is able to check in advance as to whether there is potential for any conflict of interest that is likely in a sense to a grievance if something comes to light after the event? 
after a court case has been heard and decided. Could a register of interest avert the need for such complaints by enabling people to make an informed decision to challenge any perception or allegation of conflict of interest at the time rather than after the case um, has been decided? On the other hand, a concern of the Lord President is that the introduction of a register of interest could have unintended consequences and a consideration must be given to judges' privacy and freedom from harassment by aggressive media or hostile individuals. Of course, this is right, but would a register of interest increase the risks that judicial office holders face in this regard? I am conscious of time, presiding officer. I hope I have managed to set out in this speech some of the questions that I think would be useful for us to reflect on. And in the end, I understand that the New Zealand Bill was ultimately withdrawn on the basis that agreement was reached to improve the rules on recusals and conflicts of interest. I am pleased that agreement was reached there and on the issues that were discussed openly. I therefore welcome this opportunity to debate the issues raised in the petition and I look forward to hearing the views of colleagues in the Chamber this afternoon. Presiding officer, I move the motion in my name. Many thanks.